going to talk to you about floods today and their impacts on society with the major focus on people. Uh, I used to be a civil engineer and so I focused on what's happening with water and its impacts on buildings until Hurricane Katrina hit and it really made me realize that why we care about floods and flood disasters is because of the impacts on people. Um, so I'm going to drill down a little bit today about vulnerabilities, human vulnerabilities, as uh, drivers and outcomes of floods, and how we can uh, start to, to plan to, um, to measure these vulnerabilities and use them in decision making. All right. So here's a brief outline. I'm going to hit on three themes that are related um, to flood and social vulnerability. First, a little bit of a broader overview about some of the major impacts of flood disasters. Uh, then I'm going to talk about um, how specifically this one dimension of vulnerability, social vulnerabilities, is, is really important. And then talk about, expand that a little bit in the end to flood resilience and how we might, we, we might use social vulnerability measures to, um, to achieve more resilient communities. Right? So these are some images of some major flood disasters over the last 15 years. Uh, I didn't realize until about an hour ago that each one of these has had uh, some major, uh, you know, intersection with my life. Uh, the first is Hurricane Katrina in the top left. That was the event that made me, you know, switch from being an engineer to going to get my PhD in geography because I wanted to study the human dimensions. Um, to the right is a uh, flooding in the state of South Carolina in 2015, and actually that photo was probably about a mile from where I used to live. Uh, so it has some special uh, import for me. The one in the bottom left is Hurricane Harvey. I went to um, undergraduate school at Rice University in uh, Houston, and I worked there for about five or six years after. So I lived in Houston for a long time. And so the amount of rain that's shown in these, in these maps, you know, these 45 inches, 43 inches, this is about as much rain as they normally get in an entire year. Okay, in Houston, and then it dropped in four days. So you can imagine, you know, it helps put that, that particular disaster in perspective. And then finally in the bottom right, this is just from a few days ago, or a couple weeks ago, I think. So uh, I live in Iowa now, and there's been some major flooding along our western border with Nebraska along the Missouri River. It's causing a lot of angst uh, to farmers who typically have been planting their crops around the beginning of May, and so many of these fields are still damaged or too waterlogged to continue. Um, natural disasters are prolific. Uh, we hear about them from time to time, but they're going on all the time. I, uh, I put the word natural in quotes because as social scientists, uh, we, we, we have the perspective that most disasters are, are not purely natural. It, we have a lot of influence in causing them, amplifying them, um, and governing their effects. This is some data from uh, an international research center in Belgium. It's funded by the World Health Organization, and they collect information on disaster mortality and economic impacts. And what you can see on the bottom here is showing um, the number of disasters over this 20-year period, um, and each one of these icons on the bottom is a different type of hazard. And on the left, you can see that it's dominated by floods. So within this whole paradigm of disasters, floods are dominant in terms of how often they happen, how frequently they occur. Um, so I just used the word hazard. We talked about, I used the word disaster. I'm just going to take a quick detour to, so we're all on the same page um, when I use these terms in this talk. So hazard is a threat to, you know, something we care about, okay? Hazards can be chemical hazards, but for natural disasters, we're talking about floods and drought and, and heat waves and these kinds of things. It's different from a disaster. A disaster is a particular instantiation of a hazard. Um, not all floods are major, some are minor. A disaster is something that really overwhelms the local capacity to deal with it. You need to call, call in extra aid. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's logistical, maybe it's human uh, to get assistance with that. And then finally, vulnerability. So this is susceptibility to harm. And so we can think about physical vulnerability. Maybe a mobile home is more susceptible to damage from a wind event than uh, a brick house, right? Thinking like the three pigs when we were kids. Um, but likewise, people, 
Certain populations might be more vulnerable to impacts than others, depending on where you live or what kind of resources you have. Um, so this is something that can apply to both physical and um, social or human domains. So hazard, disaster, and vulnerability. I'm going to be saying these words a lot over the next half hour. So I showed you how floods um, happen a lot. Well, they also they cost a lot, okay? In the trillions of dollars over this 20-year period. Um, and so the, the floods here are again shown in the dark blue. It's showing us 23%, 6 .656 billion. Uh, what we're missing here is actually the gray, which looks like the biggest part of the pie chart. This is for these, these big storms. Um, so these giant tropical storms, hurricanes, um, localized um, major thunderstorms can also cause a lot of flooding as well. So there's some, there's some flooding impacts that are embedded in there. You add it all together and it's, it's, it's huge in terms of the economic impacts from floods. But they also affect a lot of people. In this date, particular database, this, um, from, from the um, CRED, um, this, this database is called MDAT. Uh, affected means essentially people that need short-term help. The flood has occurred, they need food, they need water, medical care, sanitation, these kinds of things. And so it's sort of a, a real short-term, uh, high need type of thing. And so floods dominant in terms of who's mostly affected in the billions. So hopefully I've made the point that floods are a big deal. It's something worthy of focusing on and studying. Um, in, but it's in the news a lot because the impacts are getting worse. It's not as if there's never been floods in the past, but there's two things that are occurring that are increasing the impacts. One of them has to do with our, how we're changing landscapes, in particular rates of urbanization. So this is um, a watershed in the city of Houston, Braze, Braze Bayou watershed. And so you got two maps here. One is showing the land use in the 1970s. And the bottom one is showing in 2010. So the, the flow of water, the, the, the slope of the terrain here is from west to east or left to right on the map. And you can see as the years you know, went by, the western parts of the watershed became, you know, went from open fields to residential neighborhoods and strip malls and streets. Okay? And what has ended up happening is people that live on the eastern edge near the end, you know, downtown Houston, they may have bought their house in the 50s or 60s, didn't flood all that much, but over time, the floodplain found them. Because as water's hitting the ground, when it's a field, it's just infiltrating. It may be going into the groundwater. It's maybe moving slowly into streams. With pavement, it's just going to go very quickly, okay? And then, then here come the engineers. Their job, I know as a former civil engineer, designing stormwater systems, sewer systems, our job is to get the water off the surface as quickly as possible, right? We want to get it into pipes and into channels as quickly as possible. Um, and so with all this urbanization, you have a lot of water that's all hitting these streams at the same time, okay? So you've got higher velocities, uh, long, shorter amounts of time between rainfall and runoff that's occurring, okay? And so this can help account for, you know, you put the same storm on the surface in 1970 as in 2010, and you're going to have maybe perhaps catastrophic damage in 2010, where 1970 was just a big rain event, okay? Uh, coincidentally, we're doing the exact same thing in, in agricultural areas as well. So there's many places in the United States um, that you know, there's a big continuing push for intensification of agriculture. And so we're farming more and more of these marginal lands where uh, maybe it's clay soils, water rains, it ponds, it saturates the roots of, this, of the plants. We don't want that, right? So they build these storm sewer systems underneath the, the, the agricultural parcels, these tile drainage. And so you're not only having this rapid movement of water through storm systems in urban areas, you're having it occur in rural areas as well. And so this, this idea of intensification of flooding has a lot to do with how we're changing landscapes. But of course, climate change is a big deal as well. Okay? So one is changing what happens to the water when it hits the ground. Climate change is intensifying the hydrologic cycle. So we're getting two things. Uh, a, there's more moisture in the, in the atmosphere, so you're getting more rain events. And the map on the left is showing um, change in precipitation 
over time. And, you know, we talk a lot in, in climate change, there's all these arguments about future projections and what the uncertainties are, but this is, this is already happened. This is historical data, okay? So climate change is, is occurring and this is just one form, more rain, but it's also more of the rain is happening in very intense storms as well, okay? And so you put these two together and so you've got more intense rainfall coming on the landscape and it's going quicker off the landscape into, into, you know, into streams and it's flooding homes and causing destructions. Going forward in time now on the right, um, climate change is, is expected to affect many, many more millions of people in terms of adverse flood impacts. So it's a serious problem. Okay? But what I want to press upon is that there's multiple dimensions to this. Right? So this is a, this is a picture of, this is the University of Iowa. In 2008, we had some massive floods uh, that inundated the campus uh, upstream in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. They, they, they had a, a massive amount of damage as well. And so I put this uh, sort of rhetorical question there, you know, what do you see? And I, I gotta admit, what I see in that picture has changed over the course of my career. As an engineer, I look at this and I'm, I'm thinking about, wow, how deep is that water and how fast is it going and what's the scour and you know, what's the damage to this building? Is it 50% damage? You know, what's the recovery time for this structure? Now, as I start to look in more uh, human impacts, I'm thinking about, wow, who's, uh, who may have lost their job? Right? Who's been displaced from their home? Um, how long is it going to take, you know, this part of town to recover versus that, that part of town, All right? So it's just multiple dimensions. So the first is how we generally think about these things in terms of the physical dimensions when we're, you know, looking at imagery and watching videos of flood disaster in some other part of the country or around the world where it's, okay, uh, what about the water? What about the impacts to buildings? Uh, another dimension is sort of this, you know, this management dimension, like what are we doing about this? And so uh, have these people in this picture that are living there, have they been evacuated? Were they warned in time? Um, what's going on with the streets? Um, are the hospitals um, set up for this? Okay, this management of the flood. Uh, but really, you need to know all three dimensions to understand flood uh, disasters. And the third dimension is the social dimension. Okay, so processes, social processes that are just ongoing every day in the United States have impact on who is affected most by disasters and how much. Um, so poverty, exclusion, discrimination, um, property ownership, right? These are different levels of social stratification that come with different sets of impacts from flood disasters. And so if we really under, want to understand the impact of flood disasters, kind of need to know all of it, right? And this is why, you know, understanding and, and working with floods is inherently interdisciplinary, okay? It's complex as well. So like I said, for me, Hurricane Katrina really highlighted the need to look at this social dimension. There's so much focus on like probability and modeling and risk. What's the Army Corps of Engineers doing with these levees and why did they fail and how can they build these stronger and all the stuff about the levee, levee, levee. But you turn on the TV, right? And you see these pictures of people, the, the floodwaters have risen so quickly that they've, you know, they've got axes and they're trying to hack through the roof so they can sit on the roof and maybe be rescued a day later, right? That, that was the story for me, you know, seeing these, these photos of someone who could look like my grandmother sitting in a wheelchair on the, on the freeway for a day or two waiting to be rescued, right? So if we want to think about people, if people are part of a disaster, which I certainly think they are, we need to ask some different questions when we're thinking about floods that are extending beyond the physical and the uh, management dimensions. So um, just a brief synopsis on like where we are in terms of impacts, these flood disasters have certainly major impacts and they're increasing, okay, with, with climate change and land use change. The way we, we tend to measure how bad floods are and how we portray them tend to be based on these physical and financial measures. What's the, you know, there's two million dollars of loss from this, this flood disaster. Um, and, but it really just looks at one piece of the pie in terms of impacts. I put a little, you know, squares here where, where we tend to focus on these direct tangible impacts. What happened to building? What happened to crops? What happened to infrastructure? Okay? 
where there's all these intangible losses too about uh, disruptions and tourism and um, or indirect losses, intangible impacts on health and, and um, mortality or just you know indirect intangible about you know what if I just lost all of my photos in my house right and I'm stressed these are these are meaningful things as well. Despite all these massive impacts, we really have no idea how bad flood disasters are because it's, it's nobody's job to track impacts. There's no government agency that's tasked with doing that. Uh, I just came off a, a we were two, two year study with the National Academy of Sciences where FEMA asked us how bad is flood, urban flooding in the United States. We did the, we worked on this for a year and a half and in the end we're just like, well, we, we don't have enough information to tell you that, okay? So these massive impacts, we don't know how bad it is and yet we still look at them as uncontrollable. Oh, the, the flood just happened, right? No, you know, discounting all of this years of development like in Braze Bayou, just unchecked development. We just want the developers to come in, we're gonna get the tax receipts, we're gonna move forward in this, that, and the other. Um, we had a big hand in the impacts of these disasters. So, yes, there's this physical dimensions, but the social dimensions are also important as well, I would posit. And so, there's this idea of social vulnerability to floods with the, based on the general idea that certain populations, now I'm gonna talk about populations here, this is, does not go down to the level of individuals, okay? So these are groups of people that, so it, they tend to be more impacted than others, okay? Um, due to, you know, baseline economic and social and institutional and political factors and processes that go on in our country and in other places as well. And so some groups depend, you know, whether it's poverty or race and ethnicity, renters, um, disability, right, can all have t lots of different manifestations in terms of greater impacts while the flood is impending, trying to evacuate, while it's actually happening, but also in the recovery stage. I know it's kind of small in here, but I put in green um, a few of the categories of populations that came up really high in terms of our study with the National Academies. We, we ended up going to four different, we went to Chicago, Houston, Baltimore, and Phoenix and talked to political leaders, um, consumer advocates, residents, um, emergency managers to understand what's driving flooding in their, in their communities. And these ones in green about poverty, about race, about uh, age, uh, home ownership and um, English proficiency and immigrant, recent immigrants came up repeatedly as among the most vulnerable when it comes to floods. Okay? So um, keep this uh, snapshot in your mind because I'm going to come back to this. Like we, we have a decent understanding of who, what types of people tend to be more vulnerable or what types of populations tend to be more vulnerable. So what can we do with that understanding? So but pause here, why should we even focus on the vulnerable? What's the point? Uh, I think there's a number of both moral reasons and um, uh, monetary reasons for doing so. Um, you know, these things that are accelerating climate change, these greenhouse gas emissions, it's not being done by those without, you know, with limited resources. It's, it's mostly being done by those with middle amounts of resources and, and lots of resources. Uh, they tend to be at greatest risk. Low-lying areas don't tend to be the most valuable, um, and so these become flooded uh, earlier, and maybe they don't have as great high, uh, housing quality as well, or coping capacities. But it's also cost-effective, because um, many low-resource communities, you can put a certain amount of money in and help many more people more substantively than in a higher-income area, where those dollars may not be spread as well, okay? And they may not have as great as needs either. So what I was happy to see in the last few years um, was some greater attention to social dimensions of disasters uh, in media reports. This is something that I hadn't really seen, even though I've been studying this for a while, um, to a large degree in the coverage of Hurricane uh, Maria in Puerto Rico, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, and, and other case studies around the world, these disasters. Um, so it's, uh, it's given me hope that we're going in the right direction a little bit. So what I do as a researcher is try and translate this, under, this broad understanding of this idea of like, you know, certain populations may be more vulnerable into something that we can measure and use. 
And so I use indicators, these spatial indicators. Um, and all y'all are familiar with indicators, even though you may not know it, okay? So every time you, you open up, you go to the web and you see the, you know, the top um, 25 best places to live, or the top 50 uh, undergraduate schools, or um, the FIFA rankings of the top soccer teams in the world, these are all indicators, right? We're taking multi-dimensional information. So in the FIFA rankings, things like, well, what was the prestige of the match? Uh, what was the score? Was it a home or away game? How recent was it? All of these things go into determining what your FIFA ranking is um, for the World Cup, Women's World Cup, starting like right now. I uh, hope you all get to see some of that. Uh, um, and so we can do the same thing for looking at the system instead of soccer, the system of disasters, particularly social. And we can build these indicators using some of these variables that I showed you in the previous chart, right? Renters, age, these kinds of things. We can collect data from the US Census Bureau. We can represent these constructs with variables. We can build statistical models with these variables, come up with a single number, like you know the FIFA ranking of Spain is three. Right? Likewise, we can say in this particular county, this is the 15th most vulnerable county. And now we can map this as well, so we can get a you know, you know, spatial representation of vulnerability. Okay? This is a, the leading measure of social vulnerability. This is done for the United States at the US county scale. The red is showing the places that are in the top standard deviation or half a standard deviation, roughly the top 15, 17% of observations. The uh, blue are the, are the lowest, okay? And so at a national scale, if you're trying to identify trouble spots and maybe set funding priorities to invest money or programs where they're the most vulnerable, you can see how something like this might be useful, okay? So this is the general idea about social vulnerability indicators and helping to measure this abstract construct, then we can start to do something about it. We can start to manage this, this, this challenge. And so in social vulnerability, there's several broad research questions that I'm always interested in. Um, so in terms of identifying trouble spots, which places are most vulnerable? If you identify these places, who are the most vulnerable people in these places? Um, once you have this, this surface that you can map, you can also compare with physical hazard like flood depths, for example. Oh, how do these two compare? Um, and then also if you have this measure of social vulnerability, um, one of the things I've been doing a lot late, uh, more recently over the last year is that now we can start to use this to evaluate the, the equity in existing programs. So after a disaster, there's you know, disbursement of resources. Well, how equitable is this disbursement of resources? Is it actually going to the people that need it the most? Open question. So here's an example of looking at the comparison between social vulnerability and physical flood hazards. So this is a, these are um, flood maps. On the left, you see um, where there are available FEMA flood maps for the United States. So there's this thing called the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, where you can buy uh, flood insurance. So if you have damage to your house from a flood, um, you, can get, you can submit a claim and get um, reimbursed. Well, in order to do this, to set actuarial rates, they need to know where the most hazardous places are, so they build these flood maps. But as you can see from this map, there's big gaps in the United States where these exist. And even where they do exist, they're of highly varying quality. We've been working with a collaborator out of um, University of Bristol in England. Now they've spun off a company called Fathom. And they've developed this procedure to build a flood map for the, for, at the continental scale. And so you have one on the left is the county maps. This is FEMA. This one on the right is this flood map, um, which as you can see is much higher resolution. All right, so now we have the surface, this landscape of flood depths and extent for the entire country. Um, so this is this physical dimension that's represented here. We can then build the social dimension using some of these variables like I was saying. Using some statistical techniques, we take these large set of variables and reduce them, in this case, into six, six different factors. Okay? Income and wealth, socioeconomic status, um, you know, gender and race, dependency, combine these and we build a social vulnerability measure. This one is at a scale, geographic scale, that's actually smaller than a U.S. county. So the U.S. county 
In terms of size, then you might have zip codes that are smaller than counties. And then you have these things called census tracts, which are a bit smaller than zip codes. Okay? That's the scale that we did the analysis here. But you see some similar patterns to the map that I showed you before, the Rio Grande Valley, Southwest United States, along the Mississippi, Lower Mississippi Basin, you have areas of higher vulnerability that are depicted here in brown. Okay? So now I have a surface of physical vulnerability from flood depths. Now I also have a, um, a surface of social vulnerability, and we can combine these in a geographic information system, or a GIS, okay? tool of geographers. Um, and also kind of do some fancy sort of spatial clustering approaches. So this is, I kind of geek out on this map. Um, my graduate students made it a month or two ago. And for me, it's super interesting. So what you have is you have two variables, right? Flood depth and social vulnerability. And we're combining them into these spatial clusters where, you know, the social vulnerability of this area is very similar to the social vulnerability around it. This forms a spatial cluster. So in red, what we have is clusters that are both high in social vulnerability and high in flood hazard, okay? If I'm FEMA at a national scale, this is where I want to focus my resources if I want, indeed want to reduce vulnerability, right? So identifying trouble spots and setting priorities about these spatial indicators, doing analysis might say, look, I want to focus on these areas. The orange is where you have um, low flood hazard but high social vulnerability. Now what happens if, with continuing climate change in the future if these places start to become high flood hazard? Now you have both high, you have high in both. So these might be areas of concern in the future, okay? The dark blue is places of high flood hazard but low social vulnerability. But we've had many times and places where we've had rapid demographic change in small areas in the United States. And so a place that's slow in social vulnerability now, 10 years from now, could be high, okay? And so with rapid demographic change, these also could be areas of concern in the future. But combining these two different you know, forms of vulnerability gives you a deeper understanding of the multidimensionality of flood disasters, okay? And this impacts. Now, so we've created these high, high clusters. I'm gonna focus on this. So what's going on in these high, high clusters? Um, and how many people live there, okay? So we did this analysis. What I showed here on the map is a 1% chance flood, also known as the 100-year flood, okay? Um, and so we did the analysis for the 100-year flood and the 500-year flood as well. And so you have the orange bars, the 100-year, the red, the 500-year. It's showing in these high, high clusters, about 15 million people are living in these, right? So there's a lot of people that are in these really high hazardous areas in the United States that it, when a you know, flood disaster hits, they're gonna be highly vulnerable. And likewise, you can see how many people live in the high-low clusters or the low-high. Um, but for me, I was also then interested in not only how many people live there, but what kinds of characteristics are dominating in those places. And so what we found, we were able to compare you know, what are the, you know, the, the demographic characteristics in the high-high clusters versus everywhere else, okay? So for example, Median house value. In the high, high clusters, around $106,000 for the median house value. Everywhere else, more than twice that, okay? So you can see these big disparities economically here, and that's a wealth indicator. An income indicator, you're seeing these big gaps. Uh, race has come up in a big way in terms of percentages. Um, family structure and households in poverty. It's essentially it's saying the story that in these places where it's both high flood vulnerability and high social vulnerability, it's these intersections of low socioeconomic status and race, okay? Which is the story of our country, <laughs> right? Uh, it's been going on for forever. We have all these systems that maintain, perpetuate this. Um, so it's maybe not so you know, surprising that we see it here again also in disaster vulnerability. But with identifying these places, then maybe we can start to do something about it, okay? So another way that we can use these social vulnerability measures, something I've been interested in, I, talked, I showed you that picture of the South Carolina flood in 2015. Um, one of my colleagues, he used to work with FEMA, so he's, he's the data guy, right? I'm like, my head's all in the clouds, I'm coming up with all these, spinning up these ideas, he goes and gets the data, and then we have another collaborator, she's like the stats guru. So we all work together on these studies. Um, this is looking at four different programs that 
help people after a disaster, okay? This FEMA Individual Assistance, or FEMA IA, um, helps the most number of people. You see in this map here, it's N of 101,000 after the South Carolina flood. Challenge with the FEMA IA, it's really fast, but it's not, doesn't give a whole lot of money, okay? It's capped, and the average amount is just under $1,000, okay, for damage to homes and properties, okay? So you hear a lot of, you know, after disaster about people getting FEMA assistance, but it's not going to make them whole. It's barely going to, you know, do anything, okay? The thing with FEMA individual assistance is it has some income thresholds. It's really trying to get at people that are below a certain income threshold. If you have more, if you can pass a credit check, they're going to push you into the SBA to get these low interest loans. So this is a whole other set of, of people and geographies that are getting um, resources from SBA. Um, I talked earlier about the National Flood Insurance Program. So homeowners that live in flood-prone areas, or maybe they think they do, they may have bought a flood insurance policy. And so that is a far lower number of people, in this case 5,000. But these, these, um, the amount of money you can get that for that is up to $250,000. So a lot more resources compared to FEMA IA. The fourth is the CDBG, this Community Development Block Grant Program from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. This one's completely different. Um, and it only tends to happen with really big disasters that Congress comes and says, we're going to pass a bill that's going to fund this. So you get it after like Hurricane Sandy. And if you've been following the news, Congress and the President have been fighting about this, um, these, these big disaster allocations for Puerto Rico, um, the Midwest floods and Harvey, uh, a lot of that's going to be going into the CDBG. So these dollars are quite high, but you can see there's only 8,000 here, so it's serving fewer people and it tends to come far later. You know, maybe even a year later because it's got to go through Congress, right? And so all the infighting there. So what do we know about social vulnerability? Well, there's some massive inequalities that manifest in terms of adverse disaster outcomes. But we can take this abstract idea and model it with social um, indicators to build these measures that we can do something with them to identify trouble spots and maybe measure the equity in disaster programs, right? Having this measure, uh, we can do something about it. Um, and so I'm going to transition to the third part, um, thinking about this idea of flood resilience. It's, it's been all the rage, at least in the research area, but I'm hearing this when it comes to like health and all these other dimensions, like we want to be resilient, right? Do you, want to, do you want to try to reduce your vulnerability or do you want to increase resilience, right? Who's not on board with increasing resilience, right? Um, but what is it, right? These buzzwords, everybody can get on board because maybe we don't have a shared definition. It's this idea of a community's ability to absorb these impacts from a flood, okay? Uh, adapt to make different changes in the future and withstand disruption to core functions of the community, okay? So I like to use the spring analogy. So you can imagine this flood is hitting this town and this, it's pulling the spring, all right? So on the left one, the flood is so severe that the spring just breaks, right? This community has ruptured. Um, there's some massive problems. On the other one, the string is, the spring is being pulled and then after the disaster, it goes back to its original shape. I would actually say that's not so good either, because if it got all that stress in the first place, then it's probably pretty vulnerable. So the idea with resilience is not only can you withstand, but you want to come back and you want to be different, right? Better, stronger, okay? And so the National Academy of Sciences, one of the things they say is like, one of the ways we can help build resilience is to actually, we need to make, have, have an understanding of the baseline of where we stand. And so use of spatial indicators is really important for that as well right, as measures, okay? Climate change is creating urgency um, for flood resilience. So this is, a, <laughs> this is a diagram from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I almost want to, I'm not going to say it's propaganda. Um, but <laughs> so what you have on the left is like, basically they're trying to say, without us doing all this stuff, flood risk is super high. Right? But then there's all these activities. We can have zoning activities and building codes and um, build levees and flood walls and dams and all this stuff. And in the end, boy, this flood risk, way down here. There's nothing left almost, right? 
All these technocratic interventions, right? We're going to put people in a room and draw all these plans and you know, compute all these numbers, um, and we're going to get it right. There no one, nowhere in here, though, is looking at sort of these social differentiation. Will all of these activities benefit all, everybody? Okay? Or maybe even they should benefit the neediest even more, right? If you're taking this social vulnerability perspective. So this is the traditional technocratic view, um, but you know, thinking about social vulnerability is not done nearly as much. So I'm going to show you this picture. This is Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where you have um, a street. Okay, one side they put these HESCO barriers to stop the water. So one side of the street was dry and one was wet. Um, on the dry side, more valuable buildings, okay? Central business district, higher incomes. People are participating in decision-making processes. They may know their city council person or, you know, donated to the mayor. Um, Infrastructure is more protected. On the wet side, the opposite, okay? People not being able to participate, fewer resources. And so this is what we see time after time. This is the manifestation of social vulnerability, okay? Um, one of the major findings from this National Academy study is that we need to do more. We need research. We need to do, you know, develop interventions that you know, really look at these social impacts, uh, put a bit, much bigger focus on it. So they're saying, look, FEMA, HUD, you know, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, all of these agencies that are involved with you know, flood disasters, you need to start thinking about social impacts as well. Okay? So maybe after doing so, we have a different diagram. <laughs> that has something about, that recognizes the importance and the impacts to social vulner socially vulnerable populations and ideally actually encourages them to participate. And so it's not just being things done for socially vulnerable populations, but with to, uh, to reduce vulnerability. Um, and so with resilience, what some way people think about it is these sets of capitals. Right? We want to build these capitals of, of natural capital, right? Maybe we want to build more wetlands, um, more physical capital, more levees and dams, okay? Um, but people don't always have a good understanding about how to build social capital. And so these social resources are these community characteristics that are going to help build trust so that people work together. And so maybe a good start would be um, through using these indicators to identify vulnerable places to actually start investing more in these places so people can believe and start to build some trust and collective action that can be uh, to boost resilience. Here's an example of this in Iowa. Um, this is the Bee Branch watershed. Um, they're putting $8 million into floodproofing homes. And so to be eligible, you have to be below a certain income threshold and they got a big grant and they'll go and you know some some repairs to these homes, and so these people were getting frequently flooded. Okay, and so they had mold in their homes, and people were kids had asthma, and you know they're stressed out and missing work from time to time. You know you could go and do you know five or six thousand dollars of of repairs to their homes, um, maybe raising some appliances off the floor in the basements, doing some um, physical rehabilitation. You can reduce these vulnerabilities and have. This one set of money is going to help 325 different um, households. So if you're looking at the social perspective, you start to ask some different questions. So you see this dam. This is a Corville dam that protects Iowa City. Okay, Who gets protected? We're going to build dams and levees. We like building stuff, right? We're masters of nature and science. Okay, um, But who's actually going to get protected from this dam? They built this in the 60s. This downstream um, community here, which was nothing, it was called Mosquito Flats because no one would ever want to live there or even go there. Now it's declared safe, huge subdivision goes in, and then 2008 hits and it's all flooded. Okay? So it's this giant intervention of millions and millions of dollars to protect this area that was basically the only one that benefited were the developers that built the homes and then they just took off. Who bears the greatest financial impact? Maybe we shouldn't be looking at the value of damaged homes. Maybe we should be looking at what the value of the damaged home is to the person who's living there, right? I have $50,000 in my house, and maybe my house is worth 250 grand, you know, versus someone who has $50,000 of damage to their house, and their house is worth 60000 right? It's not the same, okay? So we can't just look at these absolute financial indicators to measure flood impact. 
Okay, maybe we should be looking at things relatively. Same with benefit cost ratios. This is what led Cedar, Cedar Rapids on the right to say, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers to say, yes, we will support building a, dam, uh, a levy that will protect the central business district on the one side of the river, but we won't put it on the other side of the river where there's workforce housing, okay? It's the economic dimension that's dominating, but you know, if social metrics are a part of the decision-making process, maybe we'll arrive at different you know, outcomes. Who can eva access evacuation shelters? Is it really, do we want to focus on total shelter capacity or maybe think about who can get there? What happens if you have a pet? What if you're in a wheelchair? What if you're on insulin and your medication needs to be uh, refrigerated? What if you have a baby and you need diapers and you know, maybe you can't go to the shelter? These are important things to understand uh, if we want to reduce vulnerability. Maybe it's not just the number of people displaced, but who among the population? Asking some deeper questions about the social fabric, um, how that's being disrupted by disasters. Uh, a big thing these days is after a flood disaster, we're just going to buy out these homes, knock them down. They'll never be damaged again. Okay? But this is, a, this is a tremendous amount of resources are being devoted to this. right? Who's benefiting from these resources? Right? So. Um, we can use these social vulnerability metrics to uh, gauge the equity of these massive transfers of money post-disaster. So in conclusion, um, I looked at, you know, I tried to bring you through this, this path through, you know, what are the impacts of, of, of floods? They're major, they're increasing, climate change is gonna, is gonna keep pushing them forward. Social vulnerability of, to floods is something that we have the capacity to analyze, okay? Taking this abstract construct, putting it to measures. And then we can use these measures to help assess resilience and social equity uh, in interventions, okay? So um, that's all I had. I wanted to say thank you. Um, I, but first, I wanted to, to acknowledge some um, people and um, organizations. You know, I'm up here talking about my research, but I'm, I do a lot of work collaboratively, okay? So on the bottom are two of my um, PhD students, Asif and Arande, and Craig is a faculty colleague of mine in Iowa. And these are some of the organizations, uh, Nature Conservancy, National Science Foundation, that has helped provide data or funding uh, for my work. So um, at this time, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Tate. Um, so we have um, two folks here who can run microphones up and down the stairs if you have a question. Just a reminder that this is being recorded for our public media partner, The Public's Radio. And so if you have a question, please just speak right into the microphone. Thank you. And just raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, I just happened to have gone to the movie The Biggest Little Farm last night, and uh, one of the things that happened uh, to this farm in north of, of Los Angeles was that there was a huge flood, and all the farms around them, all their topsoil got washed down into the wherever and was useless to them, all the monoculture farms, and theirs, because of their insistence on uh, ground cover and diversity, all it really did was uh, get absorbed into the ground and uh, recharge their aquifer, which had gone dry in the drought. So, uh, you know, is there any way that we can kind of push this concept that <laughs> seems so strange to people? Um, I mean, we can certainly push it. Farmers, I mean, farmers do understand their land. I mean, if, if anybody in terms of understanding the land, it's farmers because they're dealing with it all the time. The problem is the economic incentives just aren't there to do it, okay? Everything's pushing to, I mean, just drive through Iowa, just like the size of, it's a, fa it, uh, our landscape is a factory, you know? You need to think about it as like a manufacturing center. It's a factory, these enormous farms. Um, we need intensification of agriculture, these giant scales, and uh, to be competitive in economic markets. So if we want to change these incentives, we've got to change regulations and, and, and subsidies and incentives for people to do this. There's this conservation reserve program that you know, incentivizes farmers to take um, areas out of production, um, but it's not very well funded, and um, oftentimes 
um, people aren't going to do it. So there needs to be a lot more. Um, even if people recognize the value of doing it, if it doesn't make sense economically, they're not going to lose their farm over it. So I agree with you. Hi, that was an awesome talk. Thank you very, very much. Um, quick question. You, you've probably seen a lot of the work, uh, Rockefeller Fund, 100 Resilient Cities, sort of big cities being able to grind away at on these multi-stakeholder processes, deep engagement, sort of emerging awareness of all the issues you've talked about. A lot of data, localized data work, uh, geospatial data, sort of defining those issues. Um, but it seems to me that doesn't transect down to the smaller communities, the cities across America that are depopulating or globalizations hit them hard. Um, is this an area that you're looking at? And, and do you see these differences between the more prosperous communities who may have EJ communities and, and, and uh, some of the factors you talk about, but actually have assets to, to, do, to do things like they're doing in Boston or Norfolk or, or other places? Yeah, so Rockefeller, they put in this giant pot of money and they hired, um, they allowed cities to compete and the winners were able to hire a resilience director or something for their city. Um, but that's not the only thing they did. They combined with um, Department of Housing and Urban Development to, um, there's some leftover money from Sandy, um, billions, um, and they put in a, a statewide competition so states could apply. Iowa was one of them. We, we were one of the winners. We were funded at $97 million. And so I showed you this example from the B Branch watershed where they're flood proofing these houses. This is part from money from the Rockefeller Foundation. The city of Dubuque on the Mississippi River is uh, 100,000 people, and this is one small area. But we're also doing stuff in rural watersheds as well. So towns that may be 10,000, OK? And, um, but these are all pilot projects still. Right? The funding isn't there. People, there's a broad agreement about desire to be resilient, but the funding's not there. So maybe these pilot projects develop some information and best practices um, and show pathways forward. Uh, HUD is, is really experimenting, saying, here's the money. You, you guys are creative. Let's see what you can do. So ask me again in a few years. Yeah. Thank you. That was a great talk. I was curious, you brought up some social aspects that have been uh, problems across the U.S. for a number of different aspects, you know, flood being just one of them. I was curious, the, solving poverty and race issues is certainly a longer term community building aspect. In the kind of more immediate short term, would simple aspects like enforcing flood zones and codes and not allowing people to build in certain places, as well as improving natural infrastructure, would, that, would those be some of the uh, short-term solutions you'd propose, or are there other aspects you might? Um, I think these kinds of approaches, I mean, there's, there's some disincentives built into the system. I mean, we built this thing called the National Flood Insurance Program because insurance companies were pulling out of, in, in, you know, um, providing insurance for projects near rivers because they're like, this is going to flood and it's going to cause damage, right? It's not like, you know, tornado, you're not sure where it's going to hit. A river flood, you kind of know where it's going to hit, right? Um, so the government steps in and they say, we're going to provide insurance, which then sort of incentivized building in these hazardous areas. And now we've got more losses than we would have had if we wouldn't insure it in the first place. Um, so I'm a little bit skeptical of some of these big programmatic approaches. Plus, I also think they're too broad brush. Like, we got some serious needs, and I think we need more targeted interventions that are going to benefit the socially vulnerable populations and places, okay? Um, there's been several studies that have been coming out over the last year or two that are showing that disasters are making things, you have a trajectory of, you know, we have all this inequality, right? We have the haves and the, you know, less fortunate, right? And then disaster hits, and it just goes like that, okay? So disasters are opportunities. They're windows of opportunities where there's attention, there's funding streams available, um, but I think there needs to be more targeted um, a, a focus on building resilience so that communities can be whole and not these pockets of, you know, disadvantage.
thank you for being here. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, interventions, even preliminary interventions and metrics and some of the challenges and inherent tensions in those. For example, if you're looking to um, uh, lessen the number of um, low-income people or minorities in flood-prone air, flood areas, um, but that tension in terms of housing costs. So if you could talk a little bit about that, I'd be, I'd be really interested in what you have to share. Yeah, it's a real challenge, um, but continuing with my theme, I think there needs to be more resources that are put in these places. And these may not all be financial resources. I think there's a real role. So you have community members, they know they're getting hit, but, and then you've got decision makers uh, that are you know, technical, maybe financial, and they're not talking to each other because the, the professionals don't really think about <laughs> focusing on these groups, and these groups don't really know how to talk in the jargon and the language and get access. I think there's a real role in the middle for these connector groups. Um, nonprofit groups. There's, uh, there's an organization in the in city of Chicago called the Center for Neighborhood Technology. And what they do, they're a nonprofit, and essentially they work with community groups that are trying to come together, but they don't know how to move forward, right? They're getting, and so, but CNT, they know how to speak to, they have access to the decision makers and know how to speak in the language of hydrology and speak in the language of, of insurance programs. Right? So they're this intermediary that can be sort of this glue to get things done. And so what I think is that that, that's, that level needs to be strengthened um, to move forward. Uh, and so there's lots of really capable nonprofits that are doing great stuff like Habitat for Humanity, Catholic Charities. Um, and so they know the ins and outs of these disaster programs. Um, but they also really know what's going on at the household level with the challenge, daily challenges people are facing. So they have, they have all the knowledge, right? They just don't have the power. In this National Academy study that we, we went to Houston, it was the weirdest one of the four. So we'd have these tables, like these, the these four themes in the report, like one was data, one was like physical, one was social. So I was part of this, the social group. And it was all these like advocates and nonprofit folks and then you had this, like the flood czar for Houston was talking and all these city officials and the people at the social table were just steaming. They had been trying to get access to these folks for a long time and they were just getting shut out, right? Um, and so there needs to be more pathways for these connectivity between decision makers and the impacted. And I think we can, if we can hit this mid middle, middle level, I think that would be useful. 